My name is Doug Pizak, and welcome to another ASMP webinar. This one is on rights management, featuring Henrik de Gior, hosted by Executive Director Tom Kennedy. Take it away, Tom. I'm delighted to have as our guest Heinrich de Gior, who I have known for almost two decades. We first started working together when we were both at the Washington Post in the late 1990s, and I consider him one of the foremost independent experts on digital asset management. And uh, I, we've had many, many conversations over the past few years, and I think you'll find him to be very knowledgeable and uh, have a lot of great information to offer today. So Heinrich, thanks a lot for joining, and uh, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Doug. And thank you, everyone, to, for joining us today. So uh, just to get into the slide deck real quick. So we're going to be talking about why ignoring rights management will cost you. First of all, why are we talking about this in the first place? Well, I w wanted to do a survey real quick to find out if this was important to people. So I did this last month and to poll people and find out uh, based on what questions were of interest to people and the percentage of who cared about what. So the tools to assist rights management was very popular followed by the latest technology available for rights management, the smart contracts and rights management, how to learn more about rights management, standards and rights management, what is rights management for some who don't know yet, and who uses it amongst others. So a little bit about me real quick. As Tom said, I'm a consultant. I work for another damn consultancy, which is my own consultancy. Uh, I also podcast and I run about four different podcasts, including one on rights management. More about that later. I write books and blogs, uh, including on rights management. And I'm a startup advisor. Previously, I was a photographer and a media editor doing a lot of rights management. I'm not a lawyer, full disclosure. So this is not uh, legal advice. Please seek legal counsel when necessary about this. So why should I be talking to you about rights management? Well, as Tom alluded, uh, I'm a content creator and distributor of audio, photographs, and text. And many of you may also be. I'm also been a licensor, meaning granting licenses to my own content and other content. And the licensee receiving licenses and I've also been a mediator, license, being a licensee of large volumes of audio, video, text, graphics, and photos. So what is rights management? Just to clarify what we're gonna be talking about today. The management of rights is granted to the creators of intellectual property, as well as the licensees and licensors. That's what we're truly talking about. There's a little bit more verbiage about what we could be talking about, but we're gonna be focusing solely on one specific topic copyright. And that copyright is primarily what we're going to be focusing on because we could be talking about patents and trademarks and all that other stuff, but uh, that's not really our, our forte and why we're here at ASMP to discuss. So we're going to be talking about specifically digital rights, not physical. And many of you, when you think about rights management, you th think about digital rights management, also called DRM. So DRM commonly and historically speaking has been a restrictor and has not been popular because of that, because of interoperability uh, is not enabled sometimes and is blocked sometimes. And by today's standard, people want to take their content, their music, their videos, other content in different forms and on different screens. And because of that, DRM sometimes restricts this. In, historically speaking, it's been a restrictor. And uh, for that, it's not been that popular. So what we're really going to be talking about is intellectual property rights management, IPRM. And that's for audio, video, text, graphics, and photos. I'm not going to limit this discussion solely to photography, even though ASMP is the American Society for Media Photographers, because all of us are consumers of all of this content too. And we are creators of some of this other content, not just photography, even though we focus on photography at ASMP. So who uses rights management? The creators, meaning photographers, authors, the people who create music, etc. 
the licensors, the licensees, and several others. But what does that mean? Well, why is it important? Well, there's standards in rights management. And there's also, there's standards, and those standards are focused around the different things that you could do with rights management. So ad ID, for example, is for talent management, meaning the audio talents, the video talent, et cetera. The other standards that we could be talking about is IPTC, which is probably more popular about around rights management. The last, more, more importantly, and which is also popular is PLUS, the picture licensing usage system. PRISM, which is usually focused around magazine licensing, uh, meaning the images or content within the magazine. And RightsML, uh, which is a compilation of work between the IPTC and the W3C, which is in the news as well. So there's a lot of excuses on why not to use rights metadata. Rights metadata is the core of why rights management happens because there's inf metadata is essentially information about those files, about the photograph, about the music, about the, the ebook that you're using or wanting to license or licensing. And often that, that is, it's too, compl too complicated or overwhelming. Uh, another excuse is we don't have the staff or money and that's common for freelance photographers, for example, or even the end user, the licensee who wants to use that content where, oh, we don't have the staff or money to manage rights or, or just license and then we need to use it right away. And then also the last uh, is the finger pointing. It's not our job. It's up to someone else to do it uh, if they want to use it. These are not valid excuses, realistically speaking. And basically, there's a lot more around this that we could talk about, but I'm gonna refer you to the link below, and there's gonna be a lot of links uh, embedded into this slide deck uh, as to how you can overcome these challenges. Uh, first of all, the uh, complication and overwhelming often results into basically the freelancer relying on a third party to license their own work so that they will do it and they will handle it. Uh, so stock agencies, for example, in the photography agency uh, in model. Um, as far as time or money spent, we don't have it. Uh, ultimately, they will spend their time and money, um, but it usually will come up uh, at a later phase in a much more expensive phase, which we'll talk about briefly. The not our job, well, if you're licensing out your work, it is your job. If you're using it and you use it inappropriately, which we'll talk about briefly uh, in, in a few minutes, uh, it will become your job very rapidly in a legal fashion. So let's talk about some of the tools and services that can help aside from the standards that we talked about. So some of you may be familiar with some of these services. Some of them are newer. Some of them specifically work with uh, photography or video or packaging. Uh, or music, uh, and these are all services that I've been able to speak with specifically around rights management, and there'll be a lot more about it later on. There are other services, but unfortunately, those services didn't want to talk about their own product or service, which is strange. None of these paid me to talk about them or list them, uh, and they were just open for discussion around rights management and the use of their tools. So the latest technology in rights management is a very interesting one because there's the laws changing around it, both in the United States and Europe. And interestingly enough, Europe is moving faster uh, as far as changing their, their laws uh, around the usage of rights. And the US is catching up uh, because they haven't changed their laws in a long time. Uh, and the media and the distribution means for media are evolving very rapidly. Blockchain technology is one of those technologies out there that is uh, helping with rights management. And some of these, specifically companies listed here, are helping with the availability of rights management for whether it's photographs, 
or music or other forms uh, of rights management. And they're, for the most part, in testing or in beta mode uh, or sometimes alpha. Um, so they're not necessarily ready for prime time. I would refer you to look, check these out, especially uh, all of these links will be clickable. All these names will be clickable in the deck that you'll be able to get very shortly. So the next thing we want to talk about is smart contracts. Well, it's pretty much the same thing. A lot of it is empowered by blockchain, interestingly enough, by today's standard. Uh, there has been some attempts at doing it. Uh, some of them have failed, honestly. Um, but the idea is a smart contract should be self-executing, meaning it's not about a, a bunch of legalese that have to be debated between two parties or more, um, but it's self-executing. It is rational decision-making, meaning there's uh, clear points of for a transaction to occur. It is templated. It is standardized metadata. And that's the key thing is it's standardized. It is not overcomplicated on purpose, but it is standardized so it can be automated. And it enables ultimately faster payments for the delivery of the goods or of the said media. So the core of the webinar here today is why ignoring rights management will cost you. Let's look at the audience again. So there's the creators, there's the licensors, and there's the users. Typically it follows this. The challenge is many creatives, and I've been guilty of this too, is there's a create once, use once mentality. And that's something that you wanna break if you wanna to continue to have a steady stream of income as a creator. But realistically speaking, consumers will come back for more, realistically speaking. And the, so will the licensees. And the licensors too, if they like the, the content being created, regardless of whether it's a photograph, music, an ebook, or otherwise. And the idea is to have this a, re, a repeated cycle so that you're continually licensing more content repeatedly rather than a create once, use once, and then rinse, recycle. The idea is you wanna create once, use many, many times, and licensing many times, preferably. And if you can license it and monetize it each time, then you're more likely to make more money rather than create more work and sell it once. So what do we all wanna do with rights management? We wanna monetize, that's the most important thing, whether you're a creator or a licensor. You wanna de-risk, meaning you minimize the risk. So if, even if I'm a licensee, I wanna minimize the risk of being sued for using content inappropriately or just stealing it by accident for the sake of argument, which happens too often. Most of the time it is not willful uh, attacks on the creator, even though they take it personally. It is often accidental and a lack of information. This webinar is not for education around rights management, but more about the tools and processes available for rights management to happen. There are plenty of education out there already available for rights management about how to license and what tools to use, especially listed here, which you can revisit and uh, consume more of but it comes down to accountability, whether I'm the consumer, the licensee, licensor, or the creator, because I wanna take an account as a creator of what's being licensed of my content, so I know how much I should be collecting. As a licensor, same, I should know how many licensees are collecting, I should be collecting from. And as a licensee, I wanna know, well, do I have a license to use this on this particular medium, or this particular homepage, or this particular publication? Um, sometimes not. And who do I need to go back to for a license so I can properly license this and not get sued? Because it's been happened before where the licensee has to pay out significantly more than intended for uh, a, the, the proper license after a violation has happened, after an infringement has happened. So another thing that's been aware of and is uh, sometimes questionable uh, in the privacy sense is the traceability of content, which is more and more prevalent and more and more possible, especially with the tools listed earlier. 
a lot of them do traceability of assets once they are released into onto the web or on online and you can track back every single use and every single appearance because some of them track uh, apply what invisible watermarks or embedded metadata or a variety of other tools so that they can track back every single instance of a, an image for example uh, let's say I photographed an image and I, I put posted it in one place and it magically appears 12 other places but they don't necessarily have a license and I didn't want to share it openly. Well, I should be able to know, find out their IP address, find out where they are and trace back. And some of these things are automated by today's standard using some of those tools. So they can find out where they are, who's using it and essentially send a cease and desist letter or a large bill. And that happens in an automated fashion with some of those vendors. The measurability back to accountability. So you know how much you should be collecting and from whom. The enforceability, if people don't wanna pay. And lastly, the registration, because unfortunately copyright is not registered enough. And while it's, it can be enforced to a small degree, for full coverage, you wanna have it, your copyright registered. And it's not that hard by today's standard, but a recent poll showed that 90% of photographers didn't do it. Uh, so I would encourage other uh, media uh, creators, including photographers, to do that. So where can you learn more about rights management? Well, I came up with a podcast series because I thought that was missing in the uh, field, not specifically uh, uh, podcasts, but uh, missing because there's plenty of them, but a one specifically around the rights technology, rights management technology. So I interviewed most of the people that uh, are listed or the companies that are listed uh, in the, uh, and more actually, including some licensors and licensees. And in interview a series uh, that's available on iTunes under rights.tech or at rights.tech. That's the URL. I also wrote a book, The Global State of Rights Management, uh, and that includes uh, the interviews transcripts from uh, many of these interviews that is available on right stop tech uh, that book is available on Amazon and lastly there's some other resources that you'd like to uh, check out uh, there's the state of copyright infringement which was uh, a, sh a story shared uh, by one of the providers uh, there's metadata sorry rights metadata made simple by the uh, J Paul Getty Foundation uh, the uh, there's several other blogs and uh, uh, including the uh, ASMP website, which is very much on top of things, uh, amongst others, uh, around rights management because it is a concern of many uh, photographers and other content creators. So let's take some questions. From Henry uh, Hank Jones, is there any Washington DC legislation happening regarding DRM parameters? And is there any update planned for DMCA? Likely, yes. Um, while I'm not the news provider, uh, nor do I really report on the news, I would refer you back to the ASMP website and IP Watch, uh, amongst others, as well as uh, copyright and uh, technology uh, that will be on top of those things. You can also go to copyright.gov and uh, those will be reported as well as things happen. Uh, there is legislation that is uh, in the works and uh, will continue to be in the works um, for a while. Good. Sean Williams asks, is there a different type of architectural licensing and client education about licensing that's available? Yes, there is. Uh, again, I would refer you to uh, the AIA, for example, um, at the Architectural Institute of America, I believe, and a few others, including ASMP, which has some information about that because architectural photographers are uh, very uh, interested in this information to protect their work. Um, David Reeks asks, can systems and or embedded metadata like PLUS help in administering, administering rights? Yes, it can. Uh, so it, PLUS is definitely one of those systems out there uh, or registries that, that are available for the use of uh, rights management uh, and application within the metadata itself, or even if it gets stripped, um, you can use PLUS uh, amongst other standards for this. Uh, so that a license can be applied to a photograph for the sake of arguments and that it can be tracked back. Um, the, the 
the negative side is uh, some metadata is stripped from certain services, which we'll talk about, uh, because I believe there's some other questions that are going to be around that, likely. Um, certain uh, websites strip metadata from even photographs uh, to lighten the photograph. It is not necessarily to make it easier to steal, but um, it's uh, unfortunate. And But the registry is still there so that you can track back what the license was for this particular image, for example. Please. Felicia Owens asks, how can you track your images on the internet? Mm -hmm. So there are several ways. Uh, some of them are more freely available than others. Uh, amongst the other systems that I mentioned, uh, several of them are available to the, the lone photographer out there, for example, the, the freelance photographer or, or the staff photographers. Some of them are more expensive systems that uh, corporations would use, realistically speaking. So I would invite you to take a look at those. But um, often if it is indexed on the web, for example, uh, it is searchable on Google Images. It is likely findable via uh, TINEY, uh, T, uh, it's T-I-N-E-Y-E dot -E com. Um, and uh, I would encourage you to take a look at the, the tools and services that can also help you enable um, the trackability on your own as well. Here's one that plagues all of us from my Ann Ruthman. Mm -hmm. How do you describe licensing to clients who don't understand it and who believe that any photo of their work is their work? Yeah, this is a common challenge uh, of, of education, essentially. I would suggest rather than uh, vocally doing it, doing it in writing or sharing a doc uh, or a slide share about this, uh, for example, that uh, it clearly illustrates this. This is available online. You can essentially Google for it and uh, find uh, instructional videos or, or um, slide decks that it, it instruct them about that rather than having a debate back and forth between a potential client or an existing client around that. Um, so you do want to be open and have disclosure of what the charges are. So if you shoot, if, if for, your, for example, if you're a photographer and you charge for a shoot and then you charge separately for the usage of the fit photographs that you use, which realistically speaking is how the licensing would happen, Having that clearly uh, uh, spelled out in an invoice uh, and also prior to, but with instructions, if there's any question, having that go-to information so there's a third party that's very reputable and understood so that uh, it is much clearer rather than explaining it and with a fair amount of passion, let's just say, uh, and uh, having the debate back and forth is like, well, this is our work. You photographed our widgets. And going back and forth, like, but it's my photograph, one, 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 and back and forth. You, you don't want to have that discussion. It, have a third party that's already clearly explained it and uh, have less uh, emotion around it is the easier play. Please. From Mary Kate Denny, how does right management affect our images with stock agencies as to their usage of changing the rights? Mm -hmm. So their policies and uh, their procedures and, and uh, their pricing will change based on the usage and based on the market, realistically speaking, regardless of who the stock agency is and regardless of who the talent is. Um, so keep in mind that the market is uh, in flux and will continue to change based on the market needs and what the market wants to pay. Uh, that doesn't mean you have to accept the terms. You can, if you don't want, if you don't like the terms, you don't have to use the service. And you can, there are, there's plenty of uh, opportunities and other uh, providers out there nowadays. So it's a matter of selecting which one represents you the best. Uh, and keep in mind that the reach will be different based on the different players. So uh, a single photographer will not have as much reach as a very large global stock agency for the sake of argument. Uh, same thing with any other said services, whether it's audio or video or otherwise. Uh, stock agencies are also diversifying uh, across multiple mediums, not just photos anymore. It's uh, also around graphics and video amongst others. Uh, and there are different sources for uh, audio and video uh, sometimes, or, or just audio licensing um, that's available too. Kina Gonzalez asks, how important is it to attach copyright and RM metadata to images posted on the web? And if it is important, what info should always be included? So that's a great question. Thank you for asking. Um, while metadata can only help, realistically speaking, uh, again, uh, some 
uh, some sites, specific, uh, sometimes just social, uh, not just social media sites, but other sites will strip the metadata, but it can only help to have it embedded. And the type of metadata you really want to have in there is attribution as one. It's not the sole thing you want to have in there, but potentially some contact information like an email, for example, or a, uh, some kind of file information so that if someone opens file info, which can be done not just through Photoshop or other tools, but through most tools nowadays uh, that can view an image, uh, they can find out, anybody can find out where did this image come from because you don't want your work to be an orphan work. Uh, and the idea is to find out who it is that, or who to contact, whether it's an agency or an individual or some other entity, to find out, can I use this? How do, how do I get a license for this so I don't get in trouble? And I can potentially pay for it. Uh, if they can't, well, how do they contact you, right? And a name alone is not enough. You know, John Smith is not going to help much. It, uh, JohnSmith.com or JohnSmithPhotography.com. I'm just making that up, of course. There might be 16 of them. Um, but uh, there, there's probably available uh, information. So using a link to your website, for example, may help or to a website. Uh, typically what uh, stock agencies do, the big ones, they embed metadata as far as the unique ID of that file and uh, traceability as well as watermarks on those, indivisible watermarks, and maybe even a hash so that uh, they can find out, oh, you downloaded this file. Oh, and it magically appeared on your homepage. Oh, well, then I'm going to send you a bill. And they can do that in automated fashion sometimes. Uh, the more advanced ones can. Um, but the individual just definitely wants to use metadata because that's A, for findability, B, for, for searchability, and uh, C, for accountability so that you can, you can find it yourself and you know, oh, yeah, I sent you that file or no, I've never sent you that file. I, let me send you a bill. Uh, and this is what it should cost for that kind of usage because the, the price will change, realistically speaking, based on usage. Um, so hopefully that helps. From Hugh Wonderly. How do you deal with license renewal to minimize lost income while maximizing client retention? Mm -hmm. So um, you definitely want to follow up with clients. And uh, realistically speaking, license renewal is a perfect way to bring up that conversation again, meaning, oh, do you need to refresh those pictures of the widgets because you came out with new widgets uh, if you're photographing for a client? Or new headshots because people change after a while and they need new headshots for their board or their uh, company, for example, uh, or their family, whatever you happen to be shooting on a regular basis or documenting. Uh, so it's it's worth having that conversation and renewing the licenses. They may not want to because they may have bell bottoms on for the sake of argument. So they may want to refresh those images. So it's it's a perfect way, a segue to use towards saying, hey, your license is expired after N years or a year or whatever. Um, why not have us reshoot those? Or here's the bill for the continual use of those for another year, five years, whatever. Um, or I want to use those in publications too. Oh, well, let's revisit those uh, pictures. Uh, is, are the, you satisfied with the ones that are currently available to you? Or do you need new ones or other ones that we shot prior to? So that could be an easy way to uh, help monetize. Lynn Friedman asked, I can't even sell royalty free. What are my odds with rights management? Unfortunately, to be perfectly blunt, low. Um, realistically speaking, it could be relay, relaying on either the quality of the content or potentially just the metadata and searchability of that content. Some agencies rank uh, your images, even royalty free, based on the quality of the metadata. Uh, and the lower this, the, the the visibility will be uh, as, as the lower the quality of the metadata. Meaning if I put two keywords in there, you're likely not going to find it. And it's going to be ranked really, really low, like page 64. If I have a lot of metadata that's relevant to the content of the image uh, and the searchability of that image, it's more likely to be found. But that's the, the key way is having quality content, number one. Uh, and that's needed by whatever market is being served, whatever you happen to be photographing or creating for the sake of argument. And lastly, the searchability and findability of that image. If it's not embedded as far as, hey, this is a picture of a cow in a green field, uh, and it doesn't say cow, green field, and 
anything else that's relevant to the to that content, you're not going to find that cow at all, and you're it's not going to be licensed. Uh, as far as moving up, typically a lot of uh, the strategies from certain um, uh, stock agencies that may be owned, uh, may own royalty free collections as well as rights managed collections is you work up uh, as far as quality and sellability uh, of the, the said media. So if your images are rare or really great and they're selling really well as royalty free, they may entertain uh, moving it to uh, rights managed. Uh, often rights managed content is around scientific or historical stuff, uh, but uh, there's plenty of scientific stuff that is, can be found in the royalty free sector. Sometimes it's even better, interestingly enough, um, because the scientists who might be photographing them are, can only get into the royalty free uh, market. And uh, that's something that you may want to consider as well is, is, is uh, how rare is that image? You know, it's one thing if it's a plane in the Hudson, because there's only so many people that have photographed that. And, but scientific and horse of course, historical things, uh, historically, historical imagery doesn't repeat itself like pictures of Einstein, for example. Hopefully that helps. Are there any special image rights issues in dealing with China and other countries? Yes. Um, every country has their own copyright or um, licensing uh, schema. Um, do not assume that certain countries will uh, um, um, follow the U.S. copyright law or wherever you happen to be. So it is a matter of licensing or registering in those countries uh, if uh, they are followed. So it is a matter of tracking that as well because it is trackable. Uh, just like some countries track everything that happens in on the internet uh, amongst others um, Many do and many can be tracked in that sense uh, So it is a matter of tr traceability and accountability and uh, monetization in as many countries as possible Jordan Buzzy asked How do you keep uh, track of your licenses? Sure. Yeah, of course mm -hmm. um, so the Easiest and uh, most common way without using a tool uh, that has been mentioned earlier is uh, sometimes with a spreadsheet or with a some kind of uh, schedule that says, hey, these expire on date X because I licensed them a year ago. So adding into your calendar so you can revisit them shortly after, shortly before they expire because you want to give them a leeway and not say, oh, you expired, gotcha. Uh, now here's a big bill. The idea is you want to, if you give them a one-year license to use something or even a uh, license to use it on one cover of one publication or inside a publication or on a video or whatever it happens to be, is that there's a term of use, realistically speaking, uh, meaning how long it can be used, where it can be used, uh, and and how, how large the audience should be, et cetera, expected to be. All these the different terms and conditions. But uh, realistically speaking, you want to revisit it as uh, closer to the expiration of it, seeing if people want to relicense the content for other uses uh, and find out where it, it can be reused, whether it's with that said entity or a different one, because sometimes they might have a large corporation wanting to do that and they may have other publications uh, or other venues or other channels that they may want to use that content on. Um, so it, it's a matter of tracking that uh, in the calendar sense and also in the, well, did I ever license something to said entity? Um, it can be done with a spreadsheet, but that's really really basic way. It's not very efficient realistically speaking uh, uh, So I would invent uh, invite you to take a look at some of the tools James Donaldson asks are there any special media rights as they pertain to events weddings Speaking events, etc. versus others. Sure. Yeah, so so as soon as you shoot any one that you want to relicense beyond this, so let's say if I photograph a wedding uh, the primary uh, People who would be interested in that is the family and friends um, If I want to use it for my own purposes to promote myself for the sake of arguments, I need uh, a release from from uh, most of those individuals so, so I, I can use it as advertising for the sake of arguments or promotion for, for my, my services as a photographer um, same thing applies if I'm photographing a speaker, especially a well-known speaker who may have an agent um, and they may also want to uh, find out where their content is being distributed or their image or their likeness. Um, there's a whole slew of systems and, and, 
and uh, traceability av available for that. So you don't want to be caught without a, a, a release for said talent because it may limit the uh, ability for you to use those images uh, and not get in trouble for distributing those uh, wider than they should be distributed. Because they, the the more famous the individuals are, the more they want to control their image. Typically, is there a special rights management procedure for architects and large contractors, or is everything basically the same? Well. Property releases are going to vary. Uh, that's probably the, the biggest concern around uh, uh, architects, uh, uh, architectural works, uh, amongst others. Um, and, and so there's the property rights, there's uh, the model re uh, releases for any people that might be in the image uh, purposely put there, uh, typically, um, or, or any of the products that might be in the, pro uh, in the, the photograph of the kitchen, for example. Um, so that if it says a certain brand names in there, are they inten intentionally put there, likely, um, and can they be licensed for other purposes? So uh, architectural photography is often a, a little bit um, wider game. I mean, so is um, rap videos that may have 20 different attributes uh, to, um, to that content, or videos that have music and uh, people who films uh, the actual content and the talent in it, and the, uh, not only the music, but the other people that they may clip, uh, add clips to. So there, there can be many, many attributors uh, uh, and people to credit and potentially uh, pay uh, for the duration of that content being displayed somewhere. Um, or at least have permission to use them. Uh, that's that's the, the the name of the game is, is having permission to use it and uh, the proper uh, licenses uh, to to do so. Hopefully that answers the question. Yeah. From David Lin, uh, Lena, there's differences in registration uh, pictures that you shoot live and old pro projects that have been published. Can you give a simple generic difference on the two procedures in registering them so so old projects uh, that's a, a very generic term it could be out of copyright for the sake of arguments I don't know how old it is realistically speaking um, there's very simple instructions on if it was uh, created at certain uh, at certain year uh, prior to copyright law X because there's been multiple versions of the copyright law uh, as it evolves and will continue to evolve um, it, it varies on that sense. So it, it's it's uh, who who's attributed to it. Are they still alive? How long have they been not alive for the sake of argument? Um, and uh, the uh, when it was created, uh, and also when it was distributed, um, and who owns ultimately if they're not alive? Who, who owns the rights to it? Because it could be an estate, it could be a publisher, it could be out of copyright. It, it varies quite widely. Um, Hopefully that answers the question. From Jennifer Tyner, what are there particular metadata fields that are used to document the rights, and how do you clearly document the rights? Yep. So uh, there are multiple different types of fields. Typically, it talks about the. I'll just use the uh, generic journalistic terms: the who, uh, who, who created, or who's in the image, or who's in the content. Um, the what, what is the content of? Uh, what is it for? Uh, the where? Uh, where is it supposed to be used? Uh, where? Is, how? How big is it supposed to appear in said media? Is it supposed to be a spot image inside of a magazine? Is it supposed to be on the cover of a newspaper? Is it supposed to be on the homepage versus inside uh, a, a website? Um, how long? So, uh, uh, how long is it supposed to be displayed somewhere? Uh, is it a year? Is it a month? Is it a day? Um, uh, so the term of use, uh, so who, what, where, when, why, and how uh, is typically answered in that, that metadata. Uh, th there, there are very different ways of, of uh, standardizing that uh, based on the different standards. So I would encourage you to take a look at, say, the PLUS standard or the WriteSML standard um, or others that may be more applicable to you uh, based on the usage of your uh, said media. Uh, so that should answer that question, relatively speaking. From Carl Warren, there are the various terms of service on social sites. Are there any red flags and uh, keywords that you should look for to be aware of? 
Uh, there are likely many keywords you could possibly search, but uh, I doubt they're going to say we're going to strip your metadata. Um, yeah, full full disclosure, um, they may want to take uh, uh, or quote unquote own the media that is posted there. Um, uh, the the more preferred way is they want to license uh, to promote and reuse and and display your your content. Sometimes they want to reuse your content in an advertisement. So uh, you can Google or you can uh, do a control F for find uh, advertising, promotion, promote, um, uh, ownership, own, exclusive, uh, non-exclusive. Um, those are the various terms you could try, try to search. Um, but I would encourage you to read the terms of service because uh, many people are, aside from lawyers, are guilty of not reading it and just accepting the terms and then complaining about them afterwards, which doesn't help anyone because you accepted them. So okay. unless you don't want to use the term, the system or the service, which is totally uh, optional too, um, keep that in mind. Okay. Carl also asked, how do you monetize content to those sites? Uh, that's a good question. So the easier way to monetize those uh, the sites that, that do that is uh, basically have a lead. It could be a lead magnet to your website, to you or to whoever assigns you work your agent or whomever or your agency um, so that it, it can lead to more content uh, uh, creation uh, or more licensing that way. That is the easiest way is to have that as a lead magnet where I show an image that's been popular or, or that I really like creating more of. And I say, Oh, this is a great image that I recently took and I have a license to release this publicly. So I'm going to either put a link on the bottom of my website or embedded in the metadata or both uh, and uh, share a link in the text of, of that uh, social media site saying, hey, uh, check out the, what I recently photographed and um, use other said taglines to say um, to soft sell essentially your services. Morton Beebe ask, what do you think is the future of marketing stock photography? And Jim Blecka says, what is the upside potential do you see for stock photography in very specialized uh, niche markets and self-marketing? Mm -hmm. Yep, so uh, the market is shifting and usually diversifying to more medium, uh, uh, or more media, should I say, like I mentioned earlier. Uh, realistically speaking, it's gonna cover um, uh, photographs, uh, if it's a photo stock agency, but there, a lot of them are covering video and graphics as well because those are needed. And typically those packages are are not just exclusive to photographs. They want other content available to them so that you can say, oh, well, I'm, I'm creating a, an infographic and I need images of this and I need graphics of that and I need video of those things. So I want to embed it all into a package. And that's typically how people are editing nowadays online. Uh, where it's not just uh, my ebook is only text. My ebook may have graphics. My ebook might have photographs. Um, same thing with a website. Same thing with a video. Same thing even with music, where I may have clips of other things in that music, um, which I need to properly attri attribute and, and potentially license, uh, especially when it's an ad, uh, whether it's a radio ad or a video ad. Um, it, it varies quite wildly. Um, so hopefully that answers that question. Len Savell would like to know your opinion on Getty Images rights management policies. So just like any other stock agency, they're going to vary and they're going to change and they're going to evolve with the market. Uh, keep in mind, some of these are publicly traded companies, so they have stock uh, holders in mind uh, and they have to have uh, stock holders in mind uh, when they do um, these uh, changes in their policies. Um, they are not necessarily to solely take advantage of the content creators, uh, which some people may allude to. Uh, they are to monetize and they are to um, potentially pay the, the creators um, usually less than the majority of what they uh, make uh, off of each use of uh, the said media. Um, that is common. Ari Cox would like to know, what is the best tool or service for photographers to use to protect their work outside of registration? Great point. So, so aside from registering, which is encouraged, uh, so you can full protection uh, if there is enforcement necessary. Um, 
the the best tool varies depending on what you're doing it who you're playing with and who you're selling or licensing to um and and where that what kind of medium you're working with as well so there are a variety of tools that i've shared i would encourage you to take a look at them to see if they're related to what i'm not going to recommend a specific tool for photographers because uh, photographers have different budgets they have uh, different needs uh, just like uh, the architectural photographers for the sake of argument versus a wedding photographer very vastly different uh, uh, markets um, and, and commercial use versus uh, personal use um, they, they vary quite wildly and there's going to be more uh, licensing available in some than others especially the commercial ones so it's going to vary um, and you need to pick the tool that is not only the, within your budget, but that actually helps you um, to to monetize, to trace, to uh, account for what you should be paid for and when. So you, if you need to dial for dollars because they haven't paid you in 90 days and it's at uh, net 30, um, you know who to contact and who uh, when it's supposed to appear and how long it's supposed to be there and when you're supposed to relicense. Uh, because they're not going to pay you, send you a check every time it's it's uh, up. Uh, you need to follow up with them. So following up is key. Mark Gilvey asks, is there a way to integrate all this into a small business strategy? It seems overwhelming. So that is something that you need to account for, realistically speaking, because essentially, even if you're a solopreneur, or a, a single photographer uh, business for the sake of arguments, or any content creator uh, and uh, alone in doing it, realistically speaking, at the end state should not be, I mean, I archived it, now I'm moving to the next job. The, the end state should be, how can I distribute this more widely, meaning not create once, use once, but create once, use many, uh, so that you can distribute this more widely, you can get releases up front, uh, be even before you shoot, uh, the, the said person or photograph the said persons. Um, so uh, that, that is the, the strategy is having the end-to-end -end life cycle, not just end as soon as you're done shooting and distributing the, the said images. It's, well, how can I monetize this, especially if you're shooting commercial, um, instead of just saying, well, they shouldn't be, they can't afford it, uh, which is a, a, a a lot of people struggle with is like, I, I can't charge that much. It's like, yes, if they want it, you can charge what the market will pay. And if, if they want to continue using it, they should continue to pay for that usage as necessary. Uh, if they don't want to use it, they don't have to pay. David Reichs asks, excluding visible watermarks, are you aware of any cases where the removal of embedded copyright info, such as metadata, has led to the infringer having to pay? Uh, I believe there are cases on that. Um, I, I would refer you to um, Google, uh, which is the easiest. And uh, there are cases uh, illustrated as far as a variety of ways of, of how um, people have been able to still recover certain um, uh, rights infringements uh, or um, uh, stripping of information. Um, in uh, some circumstances, it, it is considered uh, uh, to not to be um, allowed to do so. I think that there, are, um, I would refer you to the law as far as uh, what is what can be stripped versus. I mean, essentially, it's terms of service uh, until it's an actual law. Um, so I think that they're they're easily escaping on that because they are saying, well, as soon as you put it on our site we can do what we choose to do with your image rather than what you want us to do with that image because the want to is not the I'm going to do that because you said so. Frank Zimmerman says lawyers are expensive. What other options are there for enforcement? So I've been infringed on in the past uh, when I was a photographer and uh, the simple act of in, in informing the infringers that this image was used here on such and such a date and you do not have a license and you are infringing on my copyright and you literally use copyright and infringement in the same sentence is usually them talking to their lawyers and their lawyers typically saying whether they're in their rights or not, typically not. 
And then they go, okay, how do we resolve this outside of the courtroom? Most often it is. And how do we resolve this so it's amicable for both parties? Typically, most things are settled out of court. Uh, there's not enough documentation out there of how much is uh, infringements actually uh, appear in court versus not. Um, it would take a lot of uh, research to do that, especially across all U.S. courts. Um, but you do hear when they do bring it to court because it is a public record. And it uh, sometimes appears in newspapers or other sites. So um, the idea is... Once a uh, public entity, especially a publicly traded company, but not uh, it could be a mom and pop shop, find out that they're infringing on copyright and they, under, and they understand what that truly means and what that empowers you to do uh, and what you can do to, um, to unfortunately uh, bring them to uh, court if necessary, uh, they will quickly change their tone most of the time. Um, and if they're not, you can start down the uh, enforcement uh, uh, with a lawyer. But most of the time, before you uh, attempt to uh, contacting a lawyer, you can just tell them this is copyright infringement and see what their response is. And maybe nothing. Uh, and then there's a matter of following up again. But it, it's, it's uh, commonly uh, not something that they want to be known for. Uh, and if they are known for that, uh, there's usually some kind of contract that they try to make you sign um, so that they can get away with it. Heather Mole would like to know if you have an opinion on which of the commercially available rights management apps or services is the most effective and user-friendly for the average freelance photographer. I don't have an answer for that, so that's going to really depend on um, what you consider user-friendly as well. Um, the newer tools may be more user-friendly. Um, the, the, the also, there's the cost factor. Uh, there's a matter of how, how intricate does your rights need to be. Um, you can take a look at Plus. You can take a look at uh, a multitude of the other uh, tools and uh, standards out there. Um, so it's, it's a matter of finding the right tool and, or service uh, and the standards that uh, apply to your said media. Mark Gilvey wants to know, is there any of the metadata searchable by search engines besides the file name. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Um, it, it's, it's a matter of finding what you wanna truly search and what's made available by uh, the tool that you're scraping it with. Uh, so the, uh, some of the mediums, uh, so, sorry, some of the, the rights uh, tools out there, they, um, they embed some of the metadata into the watermark so that when your said image uh, that you've released and uh, is, is found in six other places that you weren't indebted, uh, they will come up because you were able to find them that way. Um, so I would refer you back to those uh, services, check them out and see what um, you need tracked back because ultimately if you can track it back, uh, you can prove that it was your image. Um, the, the, the proof uh, of, of saying this is the image that I am uh, accountable for and the fact that um, you need to be able to monetize that is also a factor uh, in, in a lot of these systems. Stuart Hopkins would like to know what type of source or sources there are for photo image usage terms for use in contracts. So there are a multitude of them. Um, it depends on what the, the medium is again. So uh, the, the terms of use will refer to uh, how long you can be used. Um, and this is going to vary based on the standardized metadata of, say, RightsML or PLUS or um, a variety of others. Um, as far as where it's supposed to appear, how long it's supposed to appear, uh, how, how large the audience is supposed to be, uh, because that will help uh, estimate the cost. Uh, of, um, because if you show to millions, obviously the cost may be up higher than uh, for a few hundred people. Um, print versus online, um, there's a multitude of different uh, factors, uh, geographically speaking as well. Is it just within the US? Is it just a region of the US? Is it uh, uh, worldwide? Is it, only, is it certain countries out, um, like Japan out, or uh, Australia out, or US out? 
uh, or UK out. It, 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 it's a, there's so many different factors. That's why I didn't really want to dive in uh, into the metadata or the nitty gritty details because that really depends on the SEB tool. This is uh, from John Flaylin. I have a couple of older images that were taken of teens that I did not obtain releases at the time, but would like to license now. Do I need to have the releases signed by the parent, or can I now go to the now adult subject and have them sign? I would refer to you, Laurie, on that, but uh, realistically speaking, if there were a minor then, and they're an adult now, and you can find them, and you can get appropriate uh, uh, releases for them, it, it potentially, and I'll, again, I'm referring you to lawyer on this, uh, you could get uh, permission to use it um, for what you want them to, if you're, uh, whether you're getting a general release or a release for specific use, especially if it's just for promotion, they, they may, if you can find them, number one, you may be able to get releases for them. Releases is the safest way to uh, use someone's likeness. Thank you for coming. Is there anything that you would like to add as a follow-up or in closing statement? So uh, if you want a, a, a copy of this slide deck, you can find it here uh, on SciShare uh, amongst uh, other presentations. And uh, I'll let you digest that for a second. Uh, special thanks to American Society of, of uh, Media Photographers, uh, or found at ASMP.org, uh, for putting this on. Uh, and lastly, thank you for your attention. You can find me uh, at these uh, sites here, and you can email other questions uh, uh, at that email address right there. Thank you for your help and your suggestions and your wisdom. We really appreciate it. Thank you very much, and have a great day.